Hello and welcome to another episode of the Portrait Profit Show. Oh man, we have a great show for you tonight. We've got three wonderful local photographers here to share their stories and their opinions and the things that they've learned so that we can all grow and become better for listening to their stories. But before I do that, I want to tell you who I am. My name is Jim Landers and my mission, well, it's simple. I help portrait photographers just like you make a great income doing what they love. Each week, you get tips and systems on the business side of photography designed to help you gain a mastery over marketing and sales, reducing the struggles that most photographers face so you can finally get what you deserve. You're in the right place. Welcome to the Portrait Profit Show. The Portrait Profit Show is brought to you by Digital Pro Lab and Landers Photography School. All right. Before I move into to uh, uh, into the the show today, I want to encourage you guys to leave a message, to uh, comment, to ask questions, and if we have time, I'll even ask the the uh, panelists the, the questions. Um, but before you do that, I want you to click on StreamYard.com forward slash Facebook. Now, you'll see that in the newsfeed on the original post. You may have to click the more to get down to it. Um, but if you click that, that allows me to see who you are. Otherwise, it won't register you. It'll say Facebook user or YouTube user. So we use a platform called StreamYard, and it causes us to be able to, uh, to, to simulcast to multiple different places at the same time. So we, we are found on five different Facebook pages, two different YouTube channels, and one LinkedIn page and it's all live all at the same time uh, and if you click that link that streamyard.com forward slash Facebook no matter which one of those those uh, platforms you're on I will be able to see who you are now if you want to remain anonymous then don't do that don't click on that link uh, but that's that's how that I'll be able to see you and of course I want to know that you're here so start off by doing me a favor let me know you're here live by entering into the comments Hashtag live. Hashtag live. Now, if you're watching the replay later, do uh, enter in hashtag replay. But if you're watching right now, I want you to enter in hashtag live. And of course, I'm encouraging you, ask questions, make comments, hit that like button even. Each time you hear something you like, hit that like button. If you love it, all right, hit that love button. If we say something funny, it's time to hit that smile. All right. Before I move into that, I've got a, a handful of things that in addition to the show that we don't charge anything for, I do a couple of other things I don't charge anything for. This is for everybody, but this is something that I do for each person individually. It's a free 30-minute session on the business side of photography. And uh, it's to go over your price list or to... Uh, to um, Talk about your marketing plan or look at your website, whatever it is you want to use that time for, uh, which you, whatever you feel is most beneficial to you, that's how I want you to use that time. Uh, but just sign up for it. I'm going to, I'm going to put in the comments right now, the, the link to that. So you, so you know it. So that should be showing up right now in the comments where it says Landers Photography School Business Assessment Consultation, where you just sign up. It's free. 30-minute business consultation. You can have up to one per year. Uh, there are a couple of you that are using it as an annual review. Great. However you want to use it. Uh, and, uh, hey, Jero. Hey, Miguel. Glad you guys are here. Hey, Rick. And a bunch of Facebook users. Glad you guys are here. Perfect. Again, if you're, if you're here with us live, enter in hashtag live. Um, another thing I want to invite you to is Lunch with Landers. Every single Tuesday, I take a photographer with me to lunch on me. All you got to do is show up. And uh, we talk about whatever whatever it is that you want to talk about. We, it's, it's very informal. We, we, uh, we'll talk we'll visit, we'll, we'll order food, we'll, we'll visit. Uh, it's, I'm actually at I'm actually doing this anyway. I'm at a Rotary Club meeting on every Tuesday since 2002, since I, I joined that particular Rotary Club at the Dominion Country Club. And uh, we, the Rotary Club, we just go and we listen to a speaker share something. It's, it could be uh, someone who's talking about the city of San Antonio. It could be uh, a specific cause. But we get to hear a point of view that we wouldn't other, have otherwise been able to hear. And then afterwards, you and I get a chance to talk about you and your business. So let me put that 
into the comment section as well. That way, if you want to take advantage of Lunch with Landers, you can do it. So that should be showing up right now uh, in the in the news feed. Just click that link. It's uh, calendly.com forward slash photo school forward slash lunch with Landers. Uh, so when you click on that, you'll see my calendar and it just shows the Tuesdays. It doesn't show any other day. Not for not with that link. Uh, and it shows what Tuesdays I still have available. So take advantage of it. Lunch with Landers. Again, if you're here watching us live do me a favor and, and click that, enter in hashtag live. That way we know you're watching live. Also, I want you to share this. This is not something that you should be keeping to yourself. This is something you, can be, you should be sharing because when we uplift the photography community, we uplift everyone, including ourselves. It's not, there is no advantage to keeping good things to yourself in the photography world. It's very beneficial to share what it is that you learn. Not only are you uplifting others, but you're causing clients to see things the way that we need to see them. And that is a way that's sustainable. Like prices, a lot of photographers who aren't good on the business side, which is a lot of photographers, have prices that are really too low to be sustainable. There's just no way to make a profit. So therefore, if they are watching things like this and they make changes to the way they do business, then their clients see that and other clients start seeing those higher prices, those normal prices, really as being normal, not price gouging. So therefore, share what you know. Share it with others. Hint, enter, in, enter in the hashtag live to let me know that you're watching and click on share to let others know to come on and check this thing out because we're about to start a panel in just a moment. Well, we're, we will have three people come in and to talk about today's subject, which I'll, I'll, I'll introduce in a moment to get three different points of view so that you have a, a more clear understanding and you are growing, you are becoming a stronger and better version of yourself. So click that share button. And if you know someone who really could benefit, then tag them, tag them. So that individual knows that this is something good for them. All right, let's bring in our, our uh, you know what? There's two more things, three more things that I want to mention. Real quick, uh, and so uh, this coming Saturday, uh, and I don't have it open yet, so let's do that. This coming Saturday, we uh, Landers Photography School has a class that's starting called Intro to Portrait Photography, and so I'll bring that up on the screen right now. Intro to Portrait Photography that begins on this Saturday, uh, and it is five Saturdays in a row from one o'clock till three o'clock. Uh, go to LandersPhotoSchool.com Landers Photos to get more information about that class. And then on Sunday, let's take that off and bring this on. We have the the annual San Antonio Photography Tournament. Now, this has been going on for a previous nine years. That makes this the 10th annual San Antonio Photography Tournament, and it is something that is just for fun. This it, The goal is not to find out who the best photographer is in San Antonio. This is, this is for us to have a good time. And so we will have 15 different categories. You can compete in every single one of them. You get there at 8 o'clock in the morning, and you go out into the beautiful grounds of the Dominion and you photograph as many categories as you want. Then you turn in your images and then go have lunch. And during that time, the judges are doing their thing. After that, around 1, 1 we everybody comes back and we start announcing the winners. It's an instant gratification photographer's tournament. It's not a popularity contest where you've got to post it on Facebook and get the, the most number of likes. Nope. <laughs> this is just for fun. The judges do their thing. We have the, the winners are announced and the prizes are given. We've got thousands of dollars worth of prizes from a lot of good local businesses and some not local. Um, but uh, And we hand out certificates. So we've got a first, second, and third uh, for each of the 15 categories. And then we have a best overall called Grand Champion and then a runner-up to the Grand Champion. And by 3 o'clock, it's done. It's over. You get to go home. Do your thing. So that's this coming Saturday. Uh, and you can go to essayphotoevents.com for more information. You can also go to landersphotoschool.com to get more information. And it's just 39 bucks. So take advantage of it. Uh, we... we um, we thoroughly enjoy this. This is the, the the last two years in a row we've had we've done it virtually, uh, like a lot of things have been done. So this is our first time back uh, this year. So this coming Sunday, and then on Monday is Elevate Exhibition, 
And while it's almost too late really to sign up to be an exhibitor, you could sign up still today. Um, I, and so I, I want to encourage you. In fact, if you if you ask me or if you ask Tara, the, the organizer, we can actually let you in as late as Wednesday as far as uh, being an exhibitor. Um, however, uh, if you're just if you just want to go to see what everybody's doing, this is an event that's just it's for fun, but it's to elevate um, photographers. We're, we're even dressing up, or so we're dressing up how, how we're we're elevating how we're dressed how we're dressed. So I'll be in probably a sports coat and tie. Probably won't be a, a, a suit, but uh, and there'll be uh, the women will be dressed nice. A lot of them will be in dresses. It's it's a nice event. This is the second annual event of the Elevate exhibition and it is just to make photographers feel good about what they do and to get an opportunity to visit with other photographers. So that is this coming Monday, October 17th. And if you go to elevateexhibition.com, you can get all the information you need. elevateexhibition.com. All right, enough of the announcements, man. I want to get into today's topic. We've got a great panel for you guys today. We are talking about how I deal with difficulties. Now, I'm going to bring on each one of the uh, panelists this evening just for them to say hi, and then I'm going to bring them on one at a time to actually introduce themselves. Um, but I'm going to bring each one of them on right now just to say hi real quick. So let's bring on Linda and Hello. John Hello. and Angela. Hello. How are you guys doing? I'm glad you're here. Awesome. Thank you. <laughs> we got a chance to visit just a little bit beforehand, and uh, this panel is ready to go. They have some um, some good stories to share, and uh, they uh, get along really well. As you know, we we get on just a little bit beforehand and, and talk. So this is uh, this is exciting. So. Let's uh, start off with uh, Angela Michelle. So I'm going to take off uh, John and Linda, and I'll, I'll bring you guys back here in just a moment. All right. Angela. Hello. <laughs> How are you doing? I'm good. <clears throat> Thank you for having me. Of course. Of course. So um, would you do me a favor, or us a favor, and tell us just a, a little bit about yourself and, and anything about yourself that you want to share uh, and, uh, for, for this evening, but tell us a little bit about who you are. Sure, thank you. Um, so my name's Angela Michelle, her pronouns are she, her, and I am a photographer here in San Antonio, Texas. I primarily was photographing fashion inspired portraiture and intimate portraiture, also known as boudoir. Um, I had some health challenges, which we'll talk about later, but they, uh, inspired me to go down a different route and I became a certified sexologist in 2019. My work as an intimacy coach and a body image specialist and um, I'm incorporating all these different elements into the work that I do as a photographer as well. I know you well enough to know that you'll have quite a bit to share with <laughs> us today. So thank you for, for being here. Thank you. All right. Let's bring on Linda. Hello. Hey, Linda. I'm so glad you're here with us today. Well, thanks for having me. Of course. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself? No. <laughs> hey, I like that. Somebody's got a little sarcasm in them. Well, I mean. Just a little. No. <laughs> um, well, I'm Linda Rucabina. I'm based in Bernie, Texas. I originally started in San Antonio. Um, I've been a pro professional photographer for over 25 years, which is hard to believe because, you know, I'm only 27. Um, but I specialize in, in weddings and portraiture. Um, the best thing about me is that I'm a great mother to the best child that there is on the planet. And everything else is secondary. So that's just how I live my life. Love it. <laughs> cool. Well, I'm excited to, to hear what you have to share with these questions we have today. So thank you so much, Linda, for being here. All right. So let's bring on John. Hey, John. I'm glad hey, you're Jim, here. How are you doing? Great. And you? Awesome. <laughs> Tell thank us you for about you. Of course. 
of course. Um, well, my name is John Norbert Mack, as you can see right over here somewhere. And I have been a professional photographer for about five years now, but I have actually been taking pictures of people literally as long as I can remember. I'm also a writer and I'm a dance teacher. I kind of consider myself a storyteller. It's the whole goal is telling someone's story, whether it's through dance or photography or writing. And that's me. Nice. And that's a lot of ways to <laughs> share who we are and express ourselves. Uh, and everybody does that differently. So perfect. And that, yeah. And that's the goal. I mean, I know there are a lot of photographers that like all of the photos look kind of the same. My goal is to create images that express the person, not my vision necessarily. That makes sense. Well, how about if I ask the first question of you since I've got you here? Uh -oh. Okay. All right. So the first question, I'm going to put it on the screen so everybody else can see it. But everyone has challenges, difficulties, and direction changes in their life and in their business. Could you share a major difficulty that you have had to, to personally had to deal with? Yes. Um, honestly, these days, one thing I think that's interesting is all of us have some sort of pandemic story to tell. Mine was that when the pandemic hit, again, I teach dance, I do photography, that's my primary income. You can't do those things and be six feet away from people all the time. And so business went to nothing. But more importantly, I lived alone and I became very isolated. And I went from someone who was always around people professionally and personally to someone who was pretty much alone all the time. And it was really difficult figuring out how do I move forward in this completely different environment that had changed the world. And that was a huge challenge for me dealing with the isolation. That's uh, that is a big one. Uh, definitely something that we haven't had to deal with before and it wouldn't have even crossed our minds before. Yeah, exactly. And, and everyone's experience was different because also there are, you know, large families that were sort of like stuck in a house together all of a sudden. And so, <laughs> you know, we all have our pandemic story, but it's different for all of us, I think. Yeah, no, yeah, that's the truth. Thank you, John. Appreciate you mm -hmm. sharing that. All right. So let's ask that same question of uh, Angela Michelle. Hello. Angela. <laughs> so can okay. you share with us something that you ha have or are dealing with? Yeah. So um, I mentioned my health. In 2016, I had a stroke and it uh, caused me to miscarry what would have been my first child. I got told I couldn't have kids. I was left completely blind in one eye. Um, so I see nothing out of my right eye at all. And I ended up with a really rare lung disease that they gave me about two years to live unless I could have a surgery. So <laughs> I had that surgery in uh, 2018, but unfortunately it didn't cure me. So I've had to go on to have additional procedures. Um, you know, you were talking about the pandemic and I can relate because we've all had our own journey with it. And for me, my medical procedures were delayed almost two years. And so for two years, my whole life felt like it's been on hold. And um, it's, you know, my health journey is something that's not ever gonna be over. It's something I'm gonna live with my whole life. So I have to go to like weekly doctor's appointments, weekly lab draws. And so it's learning how to um, adapt. And I'm sure we'll talk about that more. Yeah. Uh, we, you and I have known each other for, for a good while. Uh, in fact, before and yeah. during, and now what you're having to deal with after. And so uh, I, I know of your story, but I am looking forward to, to hearing more because I think, of, I think it's a very valuable one, and I appreciate that you are sharing it. You, you, uh, you are open. It's uh, you, the experiences that you've had. I'm sure not every single experience, but mm -hmm. you, you're sharing those things that you feel are going to ha at least have some potential to benefit others, and so I, I really appreciate that you do that. Thank you. 
All right, so that was Angela. Let's bring on Linda. Linda. Yes. Well, can you share with us something, some difficulty that you have had to deal with or struggle through? Well, I've, I've been pretty lucky, honestly, because my, my first difficulty didn't hit until my 20th year in business. Um, it was a pretty big one. Don't get me wrong. I was diagnosed with breast cancer, but the, the cancer itself wasn't necessarily the, the difficulty. It was losing clients as a result of it. So we'll, we'll go into detail about that, but, um, yeah, getting 20 solid years of constant business and then having to press pause on everything was pretty darn gut wrenching for sure. Man, I can only imagine. Well, it's not easy. It's not easy for sure. You, you, you love what you do. You love who you're working with. Uh, and it's interesting because I, I was, I mean, I know your story, but I, I didn't think about it from that point of view. Mm -hmm. I was thinking about your, your struggle with the, 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 the obvious, um, well, to what degree it's obvious. I'm sure it's like this, but still, <laughs> I didn't think about how, how it made you feel about working with your, uh, not being able to work with your clients. So that yeah, is an it's, interesting it's part thing. Of a mixture between like what John and Angela was saying, you know, because you're isolated, there's nothing more isolating than being sick because even if people are in a room with you, you're alone. They don't understand no matter how hard they try. And so when you're used to having so many people around, and you're working and busy and you get to create and you feel fulfilled and then all of that's just taken away. It's like sitting in a room that's just black. So it's it's really hard to hard to handle, but I tell you, it definitely helped me deal with the pandemic a whole other way than hmm. I would have before. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. Well, I'd like to ask the next question of you. Okay. And that question is, I'm gonna bring it up on the screen. What adjustments have you had to make in your life and or career because of dealing with your difficulties? Well, uh, what happened, um, I'm not going to go into numbers, but I'll say I was diagnosed in 2017. And 2017 and 2018 were probably the biggest wedding years that I had ever had in my entire career on the books. So because of my diagnosis, I decided to contact all of the clients that um, had signed with me and I gave them the opportunity to get out of the contract, get their money back. You know, if they, if they decided, I told them everything that I was going through. I felt that I still was able to, to do their weddings, but I'd understand if they wanted to pull away. So I thought I'd lose a few Well, I lost all but two. So that was pretty hard to take um, because then it, it kind of, it makes you, think in a really negative way. Um, I, I would have thoughts like, well, maybe they know something that I don't. Am I not going to make it through this? Is it a, really as serious as that? Um, it would take you into a really dark place. And then, of course, you have, well, maybe I'm just not the photographer that I thought I was. You know, you start just having all these negative thoughts. So I ended up seeing this as a blessing because I was able to just, since all but two of my weddings canceled, I could take an entire year off. I took it off. I took that time, got to be able to rest and, you know, and be with my family, take care of myself, do exactly what I needed to do. And that brought me back stronger than I'd ever been. And I had realized when I came back that I didn't want weddings to be my focus anymore. I love them. I have a great time with them, but now I, I max myself out at 10 weddings a year because now I want to spend my time photographically doing the things that I really enjoy. I love weddings. I love the love. I love the, the, the party aspect of it. The, you know, all of the beautiful things that we can do there, but I have a lot of things to say. And I decided I wanted to say that with my images. So now I give myself time to do that. So that has helped me creatively and I get to do, you know, the work that I want to do. And then that work brings in different, different um, clients that I had that I hadn't had before that want to do that creative stuff. So now I'm fulfilled both with the stuff that I do on the side. And now I get to get paid for it too, because people see what I'm doing and they like what I'm doing and that's what they want too. That's interesting. 
Mm -hmm. Huh. So do you feel that you would have evolved into that eventually, or you would have kept on doing what you were doing? Oh, no, I would have eventually. This was definitely something that lit the fire um, because I was I was given the opportunity sooner. Um, you know, again, I, I love weddings and I have a great time with them and I would never turn them away. I'm just a little picky now about the type of wedding I'm going to do um, because I, I want to be able to incorporate what I do. You know, when you, when you do a bulk number of weddings, a lot of people will tend to say, you know, I want you to do this type of photography or this style or whatever. I'm like, no, this is what I do. You're coming to yeah. me for what I do. So, you know, I've only had like one or two that I had to have that conversation with, but I'm like, you know, what, what drew you in is what you're going to get from me. So now I can, I, I don't feel the rush. I don't feel the need to book everybody that comes in because I want to be fulfilled first. Money that always comes from your fulfilled. I like that. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you for sharing that with us, Linda. Uh -huh. Let's ask that same question of, uh, let's see, of John. And that's, uh, John, what adjustments have you made in your life and career uh, because of dealing with, with whatever difficulties that you faced? It's interesting. I think in some ways I'm going to be echoing what Linda said. Um, again, when the city shut down and I could no longer make a living doing what I was doing, I realized that with photography at least, this is going to sound weird. We couldn't do it professionally, but I could still get together with folks and take pictures of them as long as I wasn't charging them. Weird catch 22, talk about it some other time. But what I did was I, I had seen on a Facebook page, someone had posted a couple of tarot cards that they had drawn by hand. And I thought, I have a lot of interesting and strange, weird photos. I bet I could come up with something for tarot. And people loved it. And I had a lot of people saying they would love a whole deck. And so what I did was I, because I, I had an office in a, in a large studio and I was, I wanted to support the studio. I wanted to make sure they stayed afloat, but I couldn't do professional work. And so I put out an invitation to people and invited a lot of my friends and brought people in to do photos for the tarot deck. And I'll, Tons of people wanted to be involved. Keeping in mind, I had to do like 70 shoots for this one project and write a book. And, and so I did a lot of shoots very quickly because it gave me an opportunity also to spend time with people. Again, like I said before, my all of my work has been very public and very involved with people. And this allowed me to invite people into the studio or we would shoot outside. Again, <laughs> I can take pictures of someone with you know a zoom lens and be 15 feet away from them. And so it was perfectly safe, but it allowed me a creative outlet to also be involved with people. And it allowed me to focus on the artistic side. I've been a portrait photographer for a long time, but it allowed me and almost forced me to think of my work more as art, which was a bit of a difference. And again, sort of like Linda said, it sort of separated in my mind, what am I doing professionally and what am I doing artistically? But it also opened the floodgates of people contacting me who wanted professionally what I was doing creatively. I had uh, a mother contact me from Dallas, and I'm in San Antonio, saying she wanted me to come and do her daughter's senior portraits. And I was thinking, okay, there's got to be a bunch of folks in Dallas who could do this for you. And so I said, what kind of photos does she want? Well, she wants to be out in the forest and do sort of a Wiccan witchy sort of theme with magic. And I was like, oh yeah, no, okay, tarot deck, that's my thing. And so it's allowed me to start to focus professionally more on my own creative outlet. And so just like Linda said, it like I was kind of forced to change gears and forced to go into this other direction just to make contact with human beings. But it allowed me to really work on my craft and I became a much better photographer because I was doing Again, I had like 70 photo shoots to do. So I improved and was able to focus my business on my passion, which is actually something you and I talked about on the lunch that we had. I remember. <laughs> and I was it's excited. An arrow, uh, an arrow across the paper. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, we all have things that are our passions. And we all have difficulties that we have to deal with. And, and we, when we find a, uh, ourselves dealing with something, 
we are creatives. That's who we are. That's, that's, that's what we are. Uh, so therefore, if there's someone who can find a, a good way to make things work no matter what, is it not us? Right. So <laughs> Thank you to Miguel, who just commented that he thinks it's a great tarot deck. Thank you, man. Yeah. Thank you for saying that, Miguel. And thank you, thank you for sharing that, John. Absolutely. All right. Let's ask that same question now of Angela. Angela, what adjustments have you made in your life and career in dealing with your the difficulties that you've come across? Yeah. So um, when I had my stroke, I was already at a point where I was really picky with weddings, but I did have some on the books and I had to call up those clients and be like, I just had a stroke. <laughs> I can't go to photograph your destination wedding. And it felt really awful. So I quickly realized I couldn't do weddings anymore. Um, and as my health deteriorated with the lung disease, I was at a point where I was on oxygen 24 seven and even photographing a portrait session was so demanding and physically exhausting. Um, and I realized I didn't know if I could continue to do this. So I, um, thanks to Jim, I had teamed up with a local boutique who I was cross promoting with doing some alliance marketing. Uh, the owner is a sexologist and she just kind of took me aside and was like, Hey, why don't you do this? Why don't you study this? Um, it kind of made sense. My degree is in cultural anthropology. I focused on sex and death rituals. So I already had a strong background in sexuality and sex. Um, so I took the next few years and I really studied uh, this particular field and I narrowed in and um, found a, a little niche that I enjoyed. Um, and with photography, I was still doing photography up until the pandemic. Um, the plan was for me to go to San Diego and have more lung procedures. When the pandemic hit, it threw everything off. I ended up giving up my studio and focusing just on the intimacy education. And I actually turned and kind of poured it back into the photography industry. So I do sex ed for photographers, intimacy education for photographers, um, where I'm teaching photographers how to interact with their clients and hold this space for what I believe is a ritual of transformation that can happen with a portrait session. Um, so I focused more on education and I realized like I still want to come back to photography and it's uh, hopefully 2023 is when it will happen. Um, I'm getting like, I'll get my last, I guess, medical evaluation to see where I'm at if I need more procedures in December. Um, and if not, then I'll come back. But I'm realizing that photography is going to be a very different uh, experience for me and for my clients. And so this time away has given me a chance to reimagine really what I want it to be. And I really want it to be about this. It's so much more than photos. It is a ritual that I will hold space for for clients. And I'm incorporating everything I've learned through um, sex ed, through intimacy coaching, my yoga training, and I'm bringing this all into the space of photography. Yeah, so it seems like all three of of you have made adjustments. You've you've uh, uh, found a different direction. You've used your beautiful creative mind to be able to move forward in a direction that's beneficial to you, but to those around you as well. All three of you have found uh, great ways, and I think that's one cool thing. And tell me if you agree with this. I, I think a lot of creatives really do think well beyond themselves. They, they care about the, the product that they put out, but they care even more so about the people that they're creating it for and even beyond that. Yeah, I, I do. I think that, you know, I think so much of what we do as creatives is we find ways to maybe even heal past versions of ourselves. Mm. And so, um, you know, maybe maybe part of what we do is we're being... I guess this example of what we wanted to see. And so, um, yeah, I think it's, it's really amazing that creatives can transform and that they can, um, 
I think that that's our, our beauty is that we're able to adapt, right? And through these hardships, I think that you'll see like all of us have been able to adapt either our business or our way of thinking. Um, and that's part of the creativity and that's part of us holding that space for other people because we want to serve other people. Well, then that's perfect for our next question. That's I'm starting with you. <laughs> is there anything or any way that you feel like you've become a better person because of having to deal with the difficulties that you've been faced with? Yeah. <laughs> so I joke um, because I'm, I think it's a little funny, but uh, my stroke literally changed my perspective. Like, And I mean that literally as in it changed my vision but it also changed my perspective on life and it really pushed me to live in gratitude. Um, and the lung disease forced me to slow down in a way that made me pause and appreciate moments that maybe I wouldn't have before. And something as simple as struggling to breathe as I'm walking down a street and having to stop and staring up at the moon and seeing the beauty. And I realized, um, I could find beauty in the darkest of moments. And that's when I knew, like I was connecting to something that was like higher than me. That was like, I guess more of a, this energy. And it made me, um, it just really inspired me in a way that I had never felt before. And so it absolutely like made me better. It, it made me a better person. It made me trust the universe. It made me uh, focus on the good that I can and let go of negativity wherever it is. Man, that's some very good perspective. Uh, and I think on the surface, we all get it. But until we've experienced the things that the the you guys the, the, the panelists yourself and the other two are experiencing we may only understand it at surface level um and and it makes sense to us if we were to read a, a poem about it it would make sense um but to have that experience to it's like 10 10 xing the understanding i would assume uh, because of what you are going through what you've experienced and what you're going to you're continuing to to improve upon despite the uh, the difficulties that you have. Yeah. Hmm. Thank you for sharing that, Angela. Thank you. All right. That same question is going to Linda. So, Linda, is there anything or any way you feel like you've become a better person as a result of the difficulties that you have faced? Nope. <laughs> I know. Would it be sarcasm? But no, it's not sarcasm at all because I've gotten through everything I've been through because of who I am. So I'm not going to give cancer credit for me being a good person. I just have been. I always have been. Um, you have it in you. Like Angela, you just said, you know, it made you see things differently. Um, you have a different perspective, whatever. But that was in you already in order for you to see that. That's That's what I'm trying to get at. Because there's a lot of people that go through what we've gone through and just crap on the world. You know what I mean? So you have to give yourself credit for being the person that you are in order to get through what you've gotten through. Um, I have always been a strong person. Um, I have my weak moments. Don't get me wrong, because cancer is a jerk. I'm trying to think of different words that I can say that I normally wouldn't say. But um, my cancer is a jerk. Um, it doesn't give a crap about your family, your friends, your job, um, any of that stuff. Um, but it, it is the only thing in the room with you when you're alone. And it tries really, really hard to destroy you. And because of who I am, it didn't. So I did have a lot of friends that um, stood by me and helped me through the darkest times. But again, if I, were, if I was not the person that I am, no one would be able to talk me out of it. No one would be able to hold my hand through it and help see me through it. So um, the thing that I've learned most about this is I have to give myself credit for getting through it because I did the work. No one else did the work. Um, I have always had a positive outlook. I have, um, you know, I'm, I'm a sarcastic heifer, don't get me wrong. But for the most part, I see the good in everything until you show me there's none. And then I move on. 
Um, I don't waste energy. That is one thing that I have done that's different. I, I don't waste energy. Um, when you show me that you're not worth my energy, I'm done. I forget your name. It's, I move on. I don't dwell on that kind of stuff because now I know that life is a finite amount of time before we think we know. But when you get that call that you could potentially die, um, that that does shift the way the way you think. A person like me, that does shift the way I think. Um, now I know, like I said, there is that I'm not as invincible as I thought I was. You know, I may think I'm superwoman, but I'm not, obviously. So um, no, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna say that it's made me a better person because I am still the same person dealing with the same issues and moving my, moving about my life as everyone else would. Um, I just I took the skills and the and the mindset and the personality that I have, and I use that to get through. So I haven't changed. I haven't changed at all. And I wouldn't want to change because it's gotten me here. I like your perspective. Thank you. Yeah, makes a lot of sense. I appreciate it. Yeah. And thank you for sharing it. I, it's one of the cool things about having these panel discussions is you hear the same stuff, but you hear it from different points of view. Yeah. It's not like there's there's not much that's new new that you haven't heard before or that you're having difficulty understanding. But hearing it from different points of view gives us a more complete understanding. Uh, and uh, the example I like to give is if, if uh, you and I were standing on opposite sides of a, a statue of, a, say, a dog, um, you would say maybe he's facing the right, and I'm saying he's facing the left. Well, from your point of view, you're correct. From my point of view, I'm correct, even yeah. though our information looks like it's contradictory. Mm -hmm. But it's both. It's, it's true. So we get to see things from different points of view. So thank you for sharing that, Linda. Appreciate it. No problem. Yeah. All right, so that same question is going to John. Uh, John, is there uh, anything or any way that you feel like you've become a better person or uh, you see things in a new way because of dealing with the difficulties that have come in your life? I actually really do. And it may seem superficial, but I think for me, dealing with the isolation that I dealt with gave me a huge appreciation for the people around me. I used to be almost kind of a Nazi about time. Like people were late. It would make me completely insane. And after like going through an experience where literally for two to three weeks at a time, I wouldn't see another human being except the people at the grocery store, God bless them. Um, if someone is willing to spend the time to come and visit me or a, meet with me or whatever and they're you know a little bit late i kind of stopped caring in a lot of ways it made me very much more patient and made me appreciate the human beings around me more and appreciate the human condition and going through something like a pandemic where we're all going through crap trying to watch the language um help me realize if we're all going through a lot let's all just be a bit kinder to each other and a bit gentler about it and lower our expectations, you know, because when everyone's going through a lot, let's just be nicer to each other so it's easier for all of us. And, and so honestly, in some ways, it made me more patient with people. It made me more understanding of people. And it helped me, I think, in some ways, make connections to people in a better way that was less demanding. And so for me personally, which is different from other people's experience, it actually changed me a lot as a person. And I think made me very much a better person than I was um, in ways I wouldn't have appreciated beforehand. So yeah, I changed a lot and I'm glad for it. That's good stuff. Thank you, John. I'd, I'd, that's interesting how, how certain things cause us to see or experience that same thing that we've experienced before, but totally differently. I mean, there's a lot of yeah. us who get upset about time. Uh, you know, it's it, it's uh, as one of your examples that if someone shows up late, um, you know, it may it may feel to some of us like that's a disrespect kind of thing. Yeah, um, that's exactly how I used to feel. And now, and now like, how is it? Stuff happens. You know, okay. it's, you know, things happen to people, and you know, they're not intentionally being disrespectful of me and my time. They just got caught behind a train or they, you know, especially people with kids, they have to 
deal with, you know, some kids suddenly being sick and, you know, all of us have things that come up. And so rather than assuming it's a disrespect, I assume something happened. And so that's the starting point. Now let's have a conversation. That's smart. So you're starting from a, a potential point of understanding and kindness. That's the goal. <laughs> that's, that's the goal. Okay, cool. I like that. All right. So next question is going to you, John. Uh -oh. What kinds of emotions do you <laughs> struggle with and what do you do to keep going despite those things that are causing you some difficulty? I'm going to be honest. Part of it, it all continues. I was someone who had a job that was continuously involved with people and my personal life was continuously involved with people. The screen is the opposite way I think it is. And um, the problem is with the pandemic, again, I had this experience of complete isolation. Well, then I have to try to reintegrate and start being around people again. And it was very difficult at first for me because I had learned how to cope with the isolation to now start being around people again. It was very stressful. I had a lot of what I kind of consider, you know, pandemic induced social anxiety. And so now what I'm working with is trying to get over that and integrate back into society. And so I make a point of, I just, I force myself to do it. I, I go out, I will try to get up in the morning. I leave the house. I just go out and be around all day just to get used to being around people again, which again, after three years is, I was very surprised how hard it was to be around people again. I mean, I would literally, if I had to go out and have an appointment, I would get nauseous, I would get dizzy, but I would make myself do it. You know, I would go out there and I would do it just to learn how to be around people again. And I would, I, my, the library has become my friend. I'll go to the library because it's a place I can go out and be around people. And then the goal is to take that and eventually, you know, be able to apply it more to my career. Like for instance, recently I was in Virginia beach at a writer's conference. I taught, I taught six, six workshops and was around people constantly. And the first day it was massively stressful, but by the end of it, I kind of was getting over it, you know? And so that whole experience was in some ways a way to overcome the social anxiety I had acquired because of COVID. And, but it was, it literally, I just had to do it. I just had to face it and make it happen and say, I mean, what are my options? Either I live alone the rest of my life or I get back into society. And so I just did it and it wasn't easy. It was hard, but I made it happen and had lots of friends helping me through that. Perfect. So you pushed yourself despite the anxiety, despite whatever negative feelings you knew that there was a brighter light at the end of the tunnel. So you just kept on going. Yeah. yeah and I, I'm going to say, I didn't know there was a brighter light, but I hoped. Okay. I hope there was one and kept pushing forward for that hope. Which gives you potential to actually get it. So that's fantastic. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Awesome. Thank you, John. You're welcome. All right. So the same question is going to, let's see, Angela. Angela, what kind of emotions are you uh, uh, are you struggling with and, and what are you doing to keep yourself going despite these real emotions? Um, I would say the biggest one for me is unworthiness. I'd say imposter syndrome is something that I suffer from. Um, I never feel like I'm good enough. And so what do I do is I just keep learning. I know that I can't ever know everything, but that um, as long as I stay thirsty for knowledge, I'll always have something that I can continue to teach other people. And I've realized how much I enjoy teaching. And um, yeah, I think just when you teach other people, I think it's you, you can get down a road of having this imposter, like, am I good enough to show others? Um, but I just, I keep learning. I keep pushing myself to learn more. Um, this year I got into um, intimacy coordinating training. And so I've been learning a lot about that and applying it to the photography industry. Um, so yeah, just keep learning. You know, you feel that way because you care. 
You want yeah. the best. You want improvement. You want people to uh, to have more and better than they've had before. And that feeling that we all get of imposter syndrome. I mean, I, I'm sure I don't come across as someone who has that. But I guarantee you, every emotion that other people are experiencing, I'm human too. So <laughs> I, I, I do, I, I experience that. Um, but I, I believe, I thoroughly believe the reason why we experience it is a, a very base level. We care. And yeah. if we didn't, I don't think we'd experience that. So and maybe we wouldn't be as good. Amen. <laughs> I don't totally agree with that. I think that's part of our motivation to become better, to learn more, to see it from multiple points of view. Because we 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 do we start off with blinders on, but if we are open minded enough, the blinders fall off, and oh my gosh, there's so much more there. If we allow the blinders to fall off, if we leave the blinders there and keep everything comfortable, we don't experience that. We have a very limited life, but we're totally unaware of it. Yep. Thank you for caring. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So that same question is going to Linda. Linda, what kinds of emotions do you struggle with and what are you doing to keep yourself going through? Keep and not keep, keep on keeping on. Yeah, I think, I think the biggest thing that I struggle with is manic behavior. Like I, a lot of times I feel like I'm running out of time. Um, I've settled a little bit this year because I hit five years uh, cancer free, which is a big milestone to reach. Um, if you if you go five years without a recurrence, the odds of it coming back drop dramatically. Um, but I'm also realistic. Um, I know there's a potential that this will come back. So there's a lot of times that I'm like, is it going to be stronger? Will I be able to beat it again? You know, those kinds of things. So I have this rush to, to do everything. Um, and during the pandemic, I was really concerned that I would, even though I've been a photographer for 22 years, I think at that point, I was like, I'm going to get rusty. I'm going to forget how to use my camera. I'm going to suck. No one's going to come back, blah, 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 all of that kind of stuff. So what I ended up doing is I had seen, I think it was on Facebook, maybe somebody up North was doing porch pictures. So I'm like, Hmm, Okay, I'll do that. Um, so me being the manic person that I am, I, I went all out. I, I started the Bernie Porch Project and I photographed 750 families in two months. That was a lot. But the benefit of it is it was, it was a major crash course in family photography. I mean, you have to be you know, I stayed good 20 feet away from everybody. And every in order to hit that number, I spent maybe five to eight minutes with, e with each family. And my goal was to give them studio quality portraiture in 10 minutes or less. And I did it. So um, every time I, I start to think or have, uh, you know, my confidence level kind of wanes a little bit, I'm like, hey, look what you just did. You know, um, and I did it completely free. If they wanted to give me a tip, it was cool, which was great. Um, but it was completely free because we couldn't charge for work, as uh, John was saying earlier. But um, the great part about it is I've continued that every year. I, I used to not do uh, minis or anything like that. But I have I have at my fingertips 750 families that I photographed. So there are people that come in and do full portraits, uh, portrait sessions from that. And then there are other people that we do mini sessions with. And I didn't have to do any kind of advertising or anything at all. So my manic behavior actually benefited me a little bit in that. I was exhausted, but at least I can look, uh, look back at it and one, no, I'm a badass, I'm sorry. I mean, if I can photograph 750 families in two months and everybody loves their photos, come on, I mean, what else, what else can you do for yourself in that kind of situation? It's, it's a hell of a pat on the back. Um, so trying to look back on that, anytime I feel low is probably the, one of the best gifts I got out of the pandemic. 750. When yes. you said it the first time, I was thinking I heard you wrong. Nope. Nope. <laughs> you did not hear me wrong. 750 families. I mean, there were times that I went wow. to years because I was so exhausted, but I, 
the people were telling me their stories. I have I'm, that's a book that I'm making right now because everyone oh. told me their stories of what they were doing yeah. to keep their sanity during the pandemic. Um, I had it all on Instagram and and Facebook, and then I got hacked majorly in July of last year, oh. which was horrible. It was absolutely horrible because of that. I didn't care yeah. about all the other stuff. I'm like I, I'm like, but I still have all those because um, I had I, I just had resigned the fact that I lost all of that information. And then a friend of mine uh, and I were talking about minis and I'm like, oh, there were some of these families that I um, I texted. And then I was like, wait, I texted every single one of those families and they texted me back their stories. Well, I still have them. So I'm like, okay. So now I've started that again because I, I do want to make, you know, it's kind of like a dust bowl type situation with a book with everyone's photos and their stories. And so I didn't lose their stories. So that's what I think is amazing. So now that's coming in the future. And um, and then I realized I have all their text, their, their numbers. So texting them for minis or whatever, you know, and now my, my complete November, December is booked. So wow. there's always, there's always a bright side. You know, I, I guess that's probably the main thing that I see from you know, manic behaviors and all of that, there is a bright side. If you just slow down long enough to look at the whole picture, step back, it's like taking a photograph. If you're not sure of what you're taking a photograph of or how you want to do it, you step back, look at the entire situation, reassess and put it back together. So all these, all these lessons that we learn in photography, you can put in your, in your everyday life. Totally agree. Thoroughly impressed with that 750 number. And, and I really like how, for, first of all, that's a huge project yeah. um, I, that, uh, you know, there were a handful of, of photographers that attempted to do something similar, mm -hmm. but I am not aware of anyone who did those kinds really of numbers. So impressive. Um, but then you didn't leave it there. You took it a step further because it's a fantastic mm -hmm. marketing tool. I, and and so honestly, I didn't want to in the beginning because I was like, I don't. Oh, it's a it. it's by default. It just happens to. And it just happened. It yeah. Just happened. So you know, I didn't. I never wanted to say I'm doing this so I can gain a list or anything like that. Because, like I said, I totally forgot that I even had them. It wasn't that wasn't the purpose of doing it. But in the process of you know, a couple of a couple of the families had emailed me and texted me and said, Hey, are you going to do something similar to what you did last year? We know you're not going to do it for free, but you know. Can, are you doing minis? Are you doing anything like that? And then I was like, well, let's see if we can incorporate this another way. You know, still like we do it by neighborhood and those who want to sign up, sign up, they get their time slot and we go do little minis and it's one day and bam, bam, bills are paid. Yay. In a hundred years, people are going to know your name because of your, your book. People will be well, reading about my that. Name because of me. There you go. <laughs> Love it. Keep going, Linda. You rock. <laughs> All right. So um, that's fantastic. I wanna, I'm going to move on to the, the next question, uh, which is, what is your favorite thing about running a photography business? Oh, my God. My absolute favorite thing is I get to be creative, period. Um, you know, it's always been in me uh, to be a photographer. I have pictures of me running around with a Polaroid camera when I was two. This is something that I've always wanted to do. So, uh, you know, from high school, you know, being on the paper, um, helping with the yearbook, running around. I was the girl that had the camera strapped to her hip all the time. So being able to fulfill my dream and get paid for it is like the best thing that I could, I could ever imagine. You know, when people ask me for advice, I always tell them, figure out what your passion is and then find out how to get paid for it. And I've done that. Um, I get to be creative every turn. Um, well, except for the business stuff, but you can, you can be creative a little bit, but, um, that's why I rely on my husband for that. He's more analytical than I am, but just to be able to, I mean, I go to sleep dreaming of projects. And then when I wake up, I get to realize those projects in real life. It's not a dream anymore. How great is that? I mean, that's the best gift anybody could possibly get. Nice. I love that. <laughs> And it's the truth. And it's something we can relate to. Um, man, so a lot of us 
I'm, I'm going back to one specific thing you said and, and putting it to, to with what you said right now, um, the manic, um, getting things done, feeling like you don't have enough time. You're probably aware of this. A lot of creatives have the opposite problem, and that's I still have time or I can do it later. I, have, I can do it next week. I can do it next month. Um, what do you say to, to those guys who are totally, in that respect, different than, your, than, than what you experience? I, when I hear I'll do it next month, it means it's not important to me and that's not going to happen. That's what I hear in those words. Uh, because you make time for things you want. Um, if, it's, if you don't do it now, it doesn't mean that much to you. And that's not, I mean, I'm not going to say that's a negative to you. It's just letting you know what you prioritize. Yeah. So if you want to be creative, if you want to do like TFP shoots or concept shoots, you know, to keep to keep the, the fire alive, the creative spark alive when you get stuck in the monotony of headshots, family shots, blah, blah, blah. Do it. Because once once I started doing that again, you know, a lot of people were surprised that I started doing these free free shoots again um, because yeah. I told myself I was going to make time at least twice a month to do a concept that I want to do. And Great. people are like, you know, why are you doing this? You know, you're not making any money. My husband says that to me all the time, too. <laughs> if I'm not making money, I'm not getting out of bed. He thinks he's, you know, Naomi Campbell or something. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> you know, not getting out of bed for less than a thousand. But, um, but to me, what I get from it creatively is worth so much more than getting paid, honestly, because then I take what I learned in that shoot because I'm, I'm very picky who I do these these traits with. Don't get me wrong. I'm not going to just pick anybody. But I, it has to be, you know, this is a lesson for all you photographers out there. When you do a, a TFP shoot, it has to be equally beneficial for both you and the model. So I always make sure that the model I choose is down for what I want to do, and then I make time for what they want to do. So we're always learning from each other and creating something amazing by the time we're done. Um, so when I... Once I'm done with that shoot, that's free. I incorporate stuff that I saw, that I that I had a vision of in those shoots with my paid shoots. You know, people see those shoots and then they're like, I want to do something like that. So it always benefits you one one way or another. That's why I always say when you're when you're doing something that you're passionate about, money will always follow, always. So if you put your heart into it, people will see it, people will want it, people will pay for it. So I don't worry so much about that anymore um because i used to stress out about that a lot you know trying to make sure to maintain the studio and all these things and that was one of the benefits of covid um in the middle of the pandemic my lease was up and my landlord decided to double my rent in the middle of covid so i'm like i was really sad for about five seconds because i had that studio for nine years I put thousands upon thousands of dollars into that place, making it beautiful. And then I'm like, you know what? That's a huge payment I don't have to pay for the rest yeah. of, you know, for a while. I'm like, I yeah. have this big, beautiful home that I can use that as my, as my office, that's where I am right now. This is my office here in my home. Most of the time I only used my studio to meet clients, consults and whatnot. So why am I so upset about that? Move on. And now, I don't have to stress about that anymore. And, and I've always been that way though. I'm like, you know, if, if there was a tight month, I'd stress for a second and then I'm like, eh, it's going to come, it's going to come. And lo and behold, the next day or two, somebody calls and there's my rent paid. There's what, you know, I, so I don't stress yeah. about that stuff. And that's one lesson I learned from my husband. He always says, what are they going to do? Take your birthday away? They can't, <laughs> can they? They can't do it. You know, they're not going to take who I am. They're not going to take my birthday away. They're not going to take out, take my fire away. I'm not going to give anybody that kind of power. So yeah. just move on. Just keep going. You know, if you're, if you're igniting your passion and constantly every day getting to utilize that passion and see it created in a work of art. I mean, come on, what else, what else you got to worry about? <laughs> Nothing. Great perspective. I love it. <laughs> Thank you, Linda. You're <laughs> Um, are we getting some great perspectives, you guys? This is fantastic. Do me a favor. If you're watching right now live, enter in hashtag live in the comments. But I'd like for you to do one more thing, not just hashtag live. That tells me that you're here, and I want you to do that on, on all the different episodes of the show. I want you to do that just so, to, so we know you're here. But for this particular one, do me a favor and write down one thing, just one word, 
that you struggle with, something that is difficult for you. It could be something very simple. It could be money. It could be relationships. It would. I, I want one word. And if you don't want to share that, that's fine. Write down one letter. Because this, when you do that, for some reason, there's something that switches in your mind that causes you to commit to improve it. So I want you to do that right now in the comments section, write down either one word. Don't, don't go into detail on it. This isn't the place to go into detail. Um, one word of the thing you're struggling with or just the first letter of the one word. If you don't want to share the whole word, that's fine. Um, but enter in something that you deal with, something that is difficult, something, some emotion, some, uh, you deal with anxiety, um, you have, uh, it, you need uh, better marketing uh, skills because your, your schedule is empty, whatever it is that you're, you're dealing with. Whatever the struggle is, write down the one word or just the one letter. Now, we're not, I'm not going to go into it. I'm not going to, uh, we're not going to bring it up on the show. This is for you because this helps you to commit to improve. And we need all the different little things we can do to help with that. All right. So hashtag life. Let us know you're here. If this is a replay for you, watch it, enter in hashtag replay. And do me a favor, you guys, share this with the people you know. Click that share button. Let others know that this is beneficial to everyone, who every photographer, to uplift every photographer. All right, back to the questions. Uh, John, I'm bringing you back up. Can you tell me what is your favorite thing about running a photography business? Honestly, that's an easy question for me to answer. It's the look on a person's face when I've done several shoots of them and they're nervous and they're not quite sure and maybe they have some self-esteem issues and then i turn the camera around and i show them the picture we did and they like that's me i look that good and the ability to be able to show someone their best self is a huge part of why i do this job the, the job part of it and it's just it's an amazing thing for me to be able to help someone find images that make them feel so good about themselves. And that was kind of a new thing for me to discover as a, when I started doing this professionally, that you know, if you take the shot the right way, you're showing the best version of them. And so for me, that is by far the best part of running the photography business is allowing people to see the best image of themselves that might exist and making them feel like they love themselves. They feel attractive, especially for people that maybe have insecurities and don't feel so attractive. You know, maybe they don't have the body that society tells us we should have. Maybe they're not 25 years old, or maybe they are 25 years old, but have insecurities. And so for me, the absolute best part of the business is when people look at the images and just love themselves in that image. Love it. Another example of how we care. We, yeah. we want someone to, we, we create because we enjoy creating, but we also enjoy the, uh, the emotion, the emotional response that someone else has of seeing what we've just created for them. Uh, I agree yeah. completely. Because for me, a good one. I mean, there's two aspects. There's, there are stories I want to tell, and that goes a lot right. with collaboration, which Linda was talking about. But there's also the part of it where I'm telling your story, and that is what I do for my clients. And being able to do that is, the, is a massive gift to me that someone comes to me and says, I want you to tell my story and that they trust me with that. That's yes. huge. And yes. that's something I do everything that I possibly can to honor so that I'm telling their story in the best way possible. Love it. Thank you for that. Appreciate you saying that. Absolutely. All right. Thank you, John. And let's bring on Angela. To, to answer that same, that same question. Angela, what has been your favorite thing about running a photography business? Um, I'm gonna say it's kind of what John was saying. It's the transformation. And, you know, when we look at photography, we can say like, yeah, there's a physical transformation. Like if we have hair and makeup and lighting and posing, but it's this internal transformation that I see clients experience that is so rewarding um, to see them fall in love with themselves or connect to a part of themselves. Uh, to be a part of that 
that growth for them, the part of holding that space for that transformation. It's just um, such an amazing feeling. And, you know, with photographers, I think we do it a lot with light. And so I would just say like the transformation of light is kind of my own little personal favorite as a photographer is just being able to transform how a scene looks or how a person looks with the way I use light. Perfect. Yep, that makes a lot of sense. And you do it real well. There's an example of it right behind you. There is. Thank you. <laughs> uh, so, um, you know, if, if anyone shouldn't have uh, imposter syndrome, it's Angela Michelle. So, but it, she, but she and I do, um, and, a lot, and probably most of us do, because we care. So, thank you for sharing, sharing that. Uh, and let's see, I'm going to ask the next question of you. And let's see. Now, this is a, this is a, a personal accountability question. What do you feel that most photographers, most individuals should focus on to make things better for themselves? So it's not, not, you know, what, not reaching out to, to um, or not the help that they get from someone else or expect from someone else. But what do, what, what does this individual need to do in order to lift themselves out of whatever they're experiencing to become that dream that they want to have in their life? They need to focus on themselves. Exactly that. <laughs> um, I think so often we like go into comparison mode where we start looking at what other people are doing. And I think that's a lot of times where we experience imposter syndrome. But I think the best thing we can do is just focus on ourselves and whatever that needs to be. So um, maybe you're trying to work on your lighting skills. Maybe you're trying to work on the business side, but always just finding an element that you want to grow and learn and focusing on that, but focusing on yourself and not what everyone else is doing around you. Perfect. Yep. Thank you. Good one. All right, let's ask that same question now of Linda. Linda, what must individuals focus on to make things better for themselves? Oh, I agree with Angela 100%. You have to focus on yourself. Um, we see so many photographers out there um, looking on social media, looking on Facebook, all these places, you know, of these rock star photographers and their fabulous lives and they must be rolling in the dough and all this other stuff. And I'll tell you, I'm not dropping no names, but I have a lot of rock star photographer friends and their life is nothing like what you see on social media. Um, I'm not calling anybody out, but I'm just saying it's, it's hard for all of us. So um, when you compare yourself to what you think someone else is, you are never going to win because that what you think they are is not who they are. It's not how they operate. It's not their day-to-day -day life. Um, this 100% it is still a job. So you have to focus on how you want to do that job, not how someone else wants to do it. You don't want to turn yourself into a clone of another. Um, I see that a lot with a lot of the big name photographers that have their, um, you know, their, their monthly subscriptions and all this stuff. And it, it really just turns out a bunch of clones of that person. And it's because they are focusing on who is teaching them versus learning from that instructor and then incorporating that into what you want to do with your life and what you want to do with your work. Um, it's real easy. It's real easy to just copy. Um, and we, we all do, we all did that in the beginning. You know, when you're trying to learn something, you, um, you know, cause I teach all over the place as well. So, um, I, but my thing that I focus on is I'm trying to give you the keys to what I do, showing you how I do it so you can learn from what I do and then apply that to how you want your business to be. Um, because we, like we talked, touched on earlier, we all have different perspectives. Um, I have a program that I'm coming up with a friend of mine, Jen, hopefully she's there. Um, but we focus on, we've, we've done workshops here where it's, you know, the same area, but two perspectives, because we're trying to teach people that no matter what, we can all be sitting, sitting in the same line and the same model, the same location. If we are being honest with ourselves, every single one of those photos will be different. 
So yeah, focus on, on what you want to accomplish and don't let that dream be, I want to be insert name here. You want to be you. So that's, that's the best thing that you can get. Yes. Love it. <laughs> and, and you're, and you're right. We do compare. We, yeah. we look at others uh, and, and we, we started off probably doing it a lot more than we do now, uh, but just because of how we've evolved, but it's something we've experienced. We're, we're very well aware um, and in a lot of different areas. So we look at what other people are doing as far as what types of work they're doing, what kind of lighting we think they're using, what kind of equipment we think they're using, what locations they're going to be at, oh what price goodness. they're going to be charging. Uh, or, or, you know, we're looking at, at that. None of that, is, other than curiosity, is of benefit to us. It is a curiosity and there's nothing wrong with being curious, um, yeah. but it, it's not, it's not meant to affect you. It's just meant to be yeah. curious. What, what are other people doing? And it's a curiosity <laughs> and we can always 10 times whatever it is that they're doing. So maybe that's one thing we're doing it for. Yeah. When people ask me those questions, like um, what were your settings? Um, my, my number one answer is always on everything else is relative. So um, I don't like to, I don't like to give a recipe. Because yeah. that's, I mean, those, exactly. there were some people that I saw in the chat that were in one of my workshops with my friend, Jen, um, they, know, they know I, that's, I don't, I don't do that. I don't do that. What I, when they ask me, Perfect. what are your settings? I'm like, what do you want this image to be? Yeah. What do you want it to look like? And then I'll help you with those settings. Uh, Copying what I'm doing. You're rare. I love that. <laughs> yeah. Well, the whole that's... point of being in a workshop is to learn, not to yeah. create a clone. So that's, I mean, I have, I have attended and I have put workshops on all over the United States and Europe. I have learned from the best in Europe and the best here in the United States. I have, nice. um, I have taken from those what worked, what didn't yeah. work. Yeah. And I'm like, you know what? There's a, this, this recipe that um, workshops have are copying what everyone else has been doing. I'm going to stand here. I'm going to photograph. And then here you come, you can photograph too. No. Yeah, That's do the funny. same thing. Make it's a clone. Fun. Make a copy. Right. It's it's portfolio <laughs> building. Don't get me wrong. It's fun. You get to you know you know we've we've been to Venice. We've been to Scotland. We've been to Sicily. We've been all, to all these places. We get to write off the trip. Cool. But in the process of doing that, what did you take home with you? You know, if you just if you did this just to have portfolio pictures, how are you going to recreate that? Because if you're taking just portfolio pictures, say you have all these pictures from Venice. I have a lot of friends that took the same workshops that I did and came home with those portfolio pictures, they're yeah. still using those portfolio pictures 10 years later. Oh, Why? Man. Because this is not Venice. This is not Sicily. This is not Scotland. This is not Rome. You need to be able to learn what you did there and bring it back here to San Antonio, Texas, because you can't rely on the background. You know, you, right. have to, you have to realize how you're going to do that where you live. So, if you're if you're if you're just trying to copy somebody, you will learn nothing. You will spend lots of money. Sure, you get a great vacation out of it, but just see it as a vacation, not as a learning experience. If you're going to do that, perfect. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Linda. No problem. <laughs> All right, let's ask John that same question. John, what um, uh, what must an individual focus? Is that the right question? Yeah. What must individuals focus on to make sure uh, to make things better for themselves? You have to focus on what you can do. And this may sound rude, but the fact of the matter is, if you need to make things better for yourself, you are the only person that's going to make that happen. The converse of that or the, op the opposite side of that is there will be people out there who want to help you and let them. I have always been very independent. I was the person everybody relied on with the whole pandemic thing, you know, things got hard. And there are some folks that were out there who really helped me and supported me and made me successful through the pandemic. And so there's two sides of it. On the one hand, I'm the only one who's gonna lift myself up by my own bootstraps and make it work. You're the only one you have to rely on. But also acknowledge that there are people out there who want to help you and let them do that. And so if you wanna make things better for yourself, Make things better for yourself. And if someone wants to help you, let them. That's it. Perfect. <laughs> Good job, John. <laughs> I like it. All right. So uh, the next question, and, and by the way, for, for the um, 
for you guys. We're skipping one of them because of time. Uh, and yeah, so the next are. question I, that I ask won't be what the next one that's on your list. Uh, so, John, this next question is for you. If you had the power to just blink, <laughs> just blink your eyes and get whatever it is that helps you, not others, because we are, as caring people definitely yeah. would answer that question in a way that helps others. No, right. this question is, what would you do for you? What would it be? I mean, that, that could be, um, you know, a, a piece of equipment, a fantastic studio, uh, knowledge of a, a certain subject, um, lighting, uh, maybe sales or marketing or how to build a website, um, better at accessing the, the, uh, uh, the, the better at assessing the the qualities of others, uh, maybe knowing multiple language, uh, better better health, um, being kinder to yourself, stop making excuses, let go of anger, whatever whatever it is. What would you do? What would you give yourself if you could just blink your eyes and boom, the change occurred right now? I'm going to be honest. I would blink and have someone appear in my life who is an expert on sales and marketing who's willing to work on a percentage because that's my limitation. And if I could find someone that would be willing to help me explore that side of it and do it on a percentage, I'd be stoked. And literally that's it. You know what? I bet you're not the only one that would say that. Oh, I'm guessing there's a lot. of. <laughs> if we're being honest with ourselves, I'm honestly, if I'm going to be a little egotistical, I'm pretty darn good at content creation. Yeah. You know, I make cool stuff. I have products that I think will sell, but I'm not great at the sales part of it. And yes, I could learn all of that and I could wish to learn it. But if I could just have someone who knows how to do sales and marketing, then I could spend my time continuously creating content that they sell and they get a percentage of it. And I would be willing to give someone a pretty good percentage because that's money I'm not going to make. And it's something you and I had talked about. I mean, I it, it's just, it's not a part of my brain. It's really not. And I've tried. I really have. But if I could have someone who is willing to do all that part of it for me and willing to take a sizable percentage, you're hired. Perfect. Perfect. Thanks, John. Thank you. All right. So let's ask that same question of Linda. Linda, if you could blink and have or just blink your eyes and have something that helps you not others what would it be see i, I thought about this for a bit i thought of it uh, personally um outside of the business you know never be sick again um never be in pain again um and then i'm like you know what i've what i've gone through made me who i am so that can't be that can't be something that i would want to change um business wise you know if I think a lot of us, a lot of us photographers, um, like John said, you know, let's have somebody handle all the all the sales or, uh, you know, the stuff that we find difficult. Or let me, you know, snap my fingers or blink my eyes and I know everything there is to know about photography. Um, sure, I mean, but then that makes things boring, you know. Um, I every time I've learned something new in this business, it has taken me on a whole different tangent that I never expected before. Um, the way I shoot is, you know, I'm not, I'm not very structured and it's worked for me. I'm not very structured. I have an idea in my head. Um, and then I go and as I start shooting ideas flow. Um, so I don't really want to fix anything, uh, because I, I like the way it is. Uh, I like who I am now because of the struggles that I've been through. Maybe it's, um, a little masochistic that I like <laughs> to have, have a little bit of struggle, a little bit of pain, but. I'm, I am my best through adversity. I am my best when I'm stressed, when I'm pressed against the wall to get something done. So um, I, I wouldn't change anything. Um, you know, now hit the lottery, maybe that might be kind of fun, but then again, I'd be bored. So <laughs> I, I mean, I think the worst thing that anyone could ever describe me as is ordinary. So I think everything makes me extraordinary in my own way. And I, I like who I am. I like how my business is. I like the work that I do. So I don't really want to rock the boat right now. I, I like it. I like that answer. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. All right. Well, thank you, Linda. No problem. Let's ask that same question of Angela. All right, Angela, if you could blink 
you had this power where you could blink and have everything, have one more thing, just one, that helps you, not others, what would it be? I'll take health for one. <laughs> yeah. um, without a doubt. Uh, there's nothing like having a lung disease and not being able to breathe to make you appreciate how precious life is, how precious breath is. Um, so to have lungs that I could go to all the cool locations and carry my equipment and photograph and trek back up, that would just be amazing. And I can only imagine, but I can just this much imagine. And so that's a perfect answer. I'm sure I'd feel the same way. <laughs> <laughs> sure, I'd feel exactly the same way. All right, so closing thoughts. We're about to, to end this in the show. Do you have anything you'd like to, to share uh, before we do? Yeah, um, so you, you asked... Well, one of the questions, I don't know if you got to it, but um, like it was, what would we tell other people? And what I would say is to keep learning, to keep adapting, to lean in discomfort, because that's where the magic of growth happens. And um, just keep pushing yourself. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. I appreciate it, Angela. You're welcome. All right, let's ask that same question of Linda. Or, uh, Linda, do you have any closing thoughts before we finish this panel for this evening? The only thing that I can say is the same bit of advice that I give to everyone, and it works in every situation. Any decision you make based in fear is the wrong one, period. So if you're afraid of something, it's push through, don't get me wrong, but do not make a decision that is based in fear. Don't make stupid business choices because you're scared of what's gonna happen in the future. Don't um, compromise your personality or, your, or who you are because you're scared you're not gonna make another sale. If you are afraid, it's not the time to make a decision. You step back, you look at the situation and think of it logically. All fear-based decisions are wrong. That's a good one. It's my mantra. Yeah. Everyone, that, everyone who knows me, I say that to them constantly. Do you? Is that because of um, because we're not thinking clearly? Because maybe our emotions are a little too strong and, and our logic's not shining through. Uh, and is that the good reason I mean, for that? You see this. You see this in business all the time. Like when um, when COVID happened. A simple decision of my um, my landlord doubling my rent. I could have said, I'm going to pay this because I'm scared. If I don't have this studio, I'm going to lose business. Didn't do it. It was, I mean, no, I'm not, I'm not going to be pushed into a decision because I'm scared of what's going to happen in the future. So okay. I let, I, you know, like I said, I was angry and sad for about five minutes. And then I looked at it logically and I'm like, okay, how am I going to spend this and make this work? So, you know, it's the same like when, when I was sick, I was in a state of fear for a good six months. I made no decisions. And there was a part of me in the back of my head, you know, because there were, there were things that were happening that I was not happy with. And I could have easily just, nope, not doing it. You know, I'm going to cut this out of my life. I'm going to cut this person out of my life. I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to do that because I was scared. So I made no decisions. And that was the smartest thing I could have ever done. Hmm. And I, I've always had this, I've always had this mentality of not making decisions when I'm scared, but it was really brought home when I was sick because, you know, like I said, there was that depression in the room with me. It was a, it was a being, it was a person trying to destroy me. And so I'm constantly fighting that. And then it would give you these, these thoughts, these horrible fear-based thoughts. You know, my daughter is better off without me. There's no need to fight. Um, you know, oh. you're going to lose your business. Yeah. Um, your marriage is going to be destroyed because nobody can handle all of this. I mean, all these horrible thoughts going through. If I would have made decisions in that Based fear state, that. can you imagine? You know what I mean? I mean that's when I realized 100% I'm like, no, you don't make decisions right now. When you are in a state of fear, that's the last thing you do. It's a fight or flight type situation. And for the most part, you don't fight or flight. 
you just step back and look at the situation. See what's going on and find your way out. You look at a horror movie since Halloween's coming up. We're always yelling at the screen. Why are you going there? Why are you doing this stuff? Because they're afraid. They're afraid and they're not making logical decisions. There's a running car. There's that commercial um, with, you know, that let's run into the shed with all of the knives and stuff when there's a running car out there. That's the exact thing I'm talking about. You make a stupid decision because you're scared. Yeah. Nobody makes logical decisions based in fear. So absolutely, that is the number one thing I think of every day in my life. Am I making this decision because I'm scared something else is going to happen? Or am I making this because this is what I want to do? Yeah. Absolutely. Well, thank you so thank much. Thank you for coming to my TED Talk. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, well, thank you for your interesting perspectives and uh, and you know you you've experienced several things and and you're you've got a very a, a willingness to share it with others uh, to uplift them. Uh, you feel like you have uh, pushed through these difficult things and that you are a, a stronger. Um, a, better person as as a result because you've pushed through and you are, st are still willing to help others with with their struggles with their concerns with the the things that they need for their future so thank you for all that you do all you're doing today and all you all you have been doing with uh, the workshops and and helping out photographers what's the point of going through it if you can't help someone else i love it thanks linda no and john Go john ahead. We're ending with you. We're going to bring all three of you back on here in a moment just to say goodbye. But you have the the last the last word. Can you no, no give us some? There. Yeah, exactly. I'm trying to I'm trying to build that pressure. No. Um, <laughs> can you do you have any closing thoughts for us? I think the most important thing is to realize that when it comes down to it, we are all in charge of our own lives, and we're all in charge of what we want to do with those lives, and. As a photographer, there's the whole business side of it, and that's hideously important, and trust me, I get that. But why did you start taking photos? Why did you start? Why did you come into this business and create a business? And don't lose that. Don't forget that you did this because you love to take pictures of dogs. You love to have the joy of puppies and kitties and things like that. Make that part of your joy. And then you can take that into a business of doing photos of, you know, doggos and, and kitties. Don't lose the passion. And I think that's not, I'm not the first person in this panel to say that. And the whole goal is to figure out why am I doing it? And that's why I do it. And it, then I would like to make money at it. And awesome. And that's what I got. Thank you. I appreciate that. And, and you, it's, it's a passion, it's a job, and you deserve to get paid. Uh, and, and so, and, you know, and actually, I'm going to comment that's kind of the challenge because those of us that love photography and it is our life and our passion forget that it's also something we should get paid for because we're thinking, I love this so much. Why should I charge X number of dollars for it? But the fact is, because it's a passion and because we have spent 20, 30, 40, 50 years become an expert people might want to pay for that but because it is our passion we forget that it has monetary value and being very realistic i hate to say it but that's something i think we need to remember something i need to remember that we deserve the money yeah yeah what do you mean 20 30 40 50 years i, I uh, I, I'm not sure I'm comfortable with that that number because in within two uh, in just over two years I will have been in photography for 50 years. Well, yeah, I so been, uh, so I don't want you telling been, people that. Is that are you trying to say something? <laughs> well, what, what's going on here? <laughs> well, dude, we are as old as we are. I mean, that's what it is. I I've been doing this literally for 35 years, and you know we are where we are, and I, I think we need to also embrace that. Because like um, you, you said, like 50 years you've been doing this. Okay, that's how awesome you are. Someone who's been doing it for six months. I mean, awesome. Glad to see you're doing this. Here are some yeah. YouTube oh, videos yeah. to learn from. Yeah. But yeah, there are those of us that have been doing this for like literally decades. And mm -hmm. like any job, I mean, if you were a an architect who had been building buildings for 50 years, 
how much should you expect to get paid? And for those of us that have been in the business all this time, or even just been doing the craft for all this time, like a painter, a painter who has been painting for 50 years should probably get more per painting than someone who's been doing it for six months. <laughs> Beauty's in the eye of the beholder. Oh, well, and that's a totally different discussion and I get it completely and I agree. Uh, John, thank you so much for thank for you, um, giving us your your opinions, your uh, experiences, and, and your gift of time, uh, because I um, uh, it, it's very much appreciated that you're willing to to give of your experiences to to make yourself vulnerable, uh, so that uh, others might be able to benefit from it. So I want to I, I want to appreciate this, this uh, was an that. interesting opportunity to talk on a more on a far more personal level than most. <laughs> most you know videos go and so and honestly thank you for asking all of us to express these kinds of emotions and thoughts with the public so thank you of course of course well let me bring on uh, bring back angela and linda and uh, so you guys th this is our, our our panel for today on on how i deal with difficulties and uh, we've heard some fantastic perspectives um, we've heard some uh, some interesting things that we may not have thought of before, and maybe uh, at least not in the direction or the the perspective that we've heard. And we are we benefit by hearing other people's perspectives. And so I, 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 I encourage you to reach out to talk to other photographers, I invite somebody to lunch, uh, and just pick their brain. I'm sure that there's very few of us photographers that would decline an offer to be taken to lunch. So it's a win-win. Anybody um, wants to offer me lunch, I'm there. <laughs> we all got to eat. Exactly. <laughs> uh, so John, Linda, Angela, thank you guys so much for being here, for sharing what it is that you've experienced, for sharing the things that the uh, the tools that you use, mental and physical, to to move forward, to to continue to grow, and thank you for your gift of time to the 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 uh, San Antonio and greater photography community. Thank you, Jim, for having me here. Of course. Thank you. Thank you. You guys rock. All right. So I'm going to take them off the screen and we're going to be talking about the upcoming shows that we have coming. Good night. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Aren't they fantastic? I love these guys. Um, so every single Monday, you get a free business lesson. And on the second Monday of each month, like today, we have a panel where we bring on three different photographers or someone who's related to the subject um, that's beneficial to the subject. And we get to experience several different points of view. So let's talk about what we have coming up um, for, the, uh, for the rest of this month, for October, the shows that we have coming. Uh, on Let's see, uh, one week from today, and those, those the shows are at noon. This is the only one we do at 6.30 in the evening. So the uh, show that's coming up in, on, in one week from today at noon is Purpose is Our High Octane Fuel. And this one, there are a lot of things that drive us. But if we don't know what it is that drives us, if we don't know um, what direction that we're even heading in, it's going to be very difficult to get to where you're going. So we're defining first what's important to us. What direction are we heading? If we're on a road trip, we're defining that we are going to a specific place. That way we can plan a path to get there. Now, what's going to fuel us? Purpose, a reason. And so we're going to be talking about that purpose a week from today. So put that on your calendar. Purposes are high octane fuel. And then on the 17th, uh, we're going to be doing a photographer competitor analysis. This is how we compare. Now, there's good comparison and there's not good comparison when it comes to other photographers. If you're building a business plan, then it is appropriate to do a, a photographer competitor analysis. If you're looking to see what others do so that you make sure that you're staying on top of what's going on and that you're not missing out on anything and that you're one-upping or 10Xing everybody else, okay, 
then there is a good reason to do a photographer competitor analysis. And we're going to be talking about what are those good ways and what are the steps? What are the things that we need to look at and consider if we're going to do that? And we don't always need to be doing that, but there are times when it's totally appropriate. Here's how. That's on October 24th. And to end out the month, it's Halloween, and we don't skip based on if there's, uh, uh, even, even if it is a holiday, we still are going to be having the Portrait Profit Show, and we're going to be dealing with unusual situations. Uh, now, this is not going to be about ghost stories. If you have them, please bring them and share them, because, yeah, I'm interested in that kind of stuff. That's pretty interesting to me. Um, but this is just about dealing with things that aren't the norm, but that you come across on occasion as a photographer. So things that are more difficult to prepare for, how do we prepare for those? That is what the topic of dealing with unusual situations is going to be about. How do we deal with things that don't happen very often and may happen only once in a career or may never happen, but how do we deal with them when we are faced with them? So dealing with unusual situations on October 31st, Halloween. Today, we've had a fantastic panel. And yes, all the other, the, for, for those past panelists that are watching right now, I, I'm not saying that these guys are better than you. I'm saying they're the best we have had all day today. <laughs> they are fantastic. They are, um, they've brought to the table some fantastic, unique perspectives that I believe that we can all benefit from. And so every month on the second Tuesday, expect more of this. We've, we've done this for uh, quite some time now, uh, and, and we, this is episode number 86, and we just keep on going. And when I say we, I'm talking about Amanda at Digital Pro Lab, uh, who's not able to be with us this evening. She's not feeling well, but she'll probably be here next week. Um, but uh, this partnership between Landers Photography School, myself, uh, and Amanda at Digital Pro Lab, our goal is to uplift the photography community both here in San Antonio and beyond, because I'm well aware that, that some of you are nowhere near here. And I'm grateful that you are investing your time to grow for yourself. And just by growing yourself, making you a better person, others are going to become better too. So you, even by default, are uplifting the photography community. So thank you for being here. Thank you for investing your time here on the, the Portrait Profit Show. Make sure to add the, the, uh, the, the uh, shows that I just mentioned on the calendar, again, every single Monday at noon, so that so you know what's coming up. Just put it on your calendar. Be here. If you, if you can make it happen, then great. If you can't, well, then watch the replay, because on each one, on all of the YouTube, uh, the, both YouTube channels, LinkedIn, and um, on the five Facebook uh, uh pages that we simulcast to, it's, you'll find it in the newsfeed. Now, on some of them, you'll find it way down in the newsfeed because they're very active groups. Others of them, you'll find them relatively quickly. Um, but feel free to, to check those out there or to review, to watch, another, watch one that you've seen already. For Landers Photography School and Digital Pro Lab. This is Jim Landers bringing you the weekly Portrait Profit Show, giving you evolving content, awareness, and even fun to the business side of photography through helpful information, step-by-step -step processes, and action steps that will help you with the struggles you deal with now so you are constantly realigned to the path that leads to the success you deserve. Be here every Monday to experience a different way of looking at the business side of photography. Thank you for investing your time here at the Portrait Profit Show. Bye for now.